Hi everybody, thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. This presentation is to cover off and give a technical overview of the TransTel 3940 series IP access control phones. In this presentation I'll be talking about the hardware, the software, the connection of the phone, and general other discussion points about general setup and all those other points of reference. Please note that this presentation and training is not a replacement for your manual and the manual is your main source of reference and should always be referred to. Also please note that specifications and software may change so some features may uh, change, disappear or be added as a product is developed through its life cycle. First of all, who's Transtel? Well, Transtel is an international brand and manufacture telecommunications products. Products such as digital phone systems, IP phone systems, voice processing systems, and IP endpoint solutions that are used in the telecommunications and IT industry. Trans the Transtel solutions are deployed around the world in business organizations such as the Federal Aviation Authority, Century 21, Remax, large hotels, residential rest homes, hospitals, and defense and military installations. Transtel products offer a range of digital and IP solutions for small office, home office, general business, enterprise customers, and are designed with a robust architecture, convenience, flexibility, and also keeping price in mind. The product we are actually presenting is the 3940 series IP access control phones. These phones offer you a wide range of options for both internal and external door entry options. The Transcell IP door phones are a standalone SIP phone. They are based on using industry standard SIP protocol. This means that the IP access phone can be connected to any standard SIP PABX, soft switch, or cloud-based telco service. All models are simple to set up and have modern aesthetics and they're made of a durable construction and provide plug-and-play installation. So let's have a look at the hardware overview. Okay so let's go through the first of the three models we're going to be going through. This is the Transcell IP3940 ACR. The last three letters, A, C and R, stand for Acrylic Camera RFI Card record, uh, Reader. If we have a look at this uh, phone, we'll start from the list going down the left hand side of the phone. We've got our acrylic uh, faceplate here. We've got our speaker. Now the speaker is rearward facing and through, you can it has actually got uh, voice channels coming through the, the back. You'll see that in a later slide that we were uh, going to be showing you. We've got our dial pad. Now this is an acrylic um, plate here. So the um, dial pad is actually backlit and uh, is easy to uh, be used at night, etc. We've got our card reader down here on the card down the bottom of the unit. Microphone. Then we've got our video camera. That is a VGA 720HD camera, uh, selectable, whatever you want to use. The display, uh, multifunctional display that one. It says intuitive display, but it's actually very multifunctional. It'll give you the status of the calls when you're dialing out, etc. And when people are dialing in, give you the information. As a technician, when you're on the field, it could also give you the IP addressing of the, um, of the phone. And or we can have day and night messages scrolling through, so uh, quite handy. You've got your scroll up, scroll down buttons. That is used in relation to scrolling through um, the phone book, for example, if we have a multi-site or multi-apartment um, um, site, say 30 apartments in a high-rise building, we could uh, use this in a foyer, scroll up and scroll down and dial um, any particular um, apartment that, that we want to. We've got our uh, program entry access key here, a single call button just to call a general um, general address if you so wish. Um, we've got a night light there. It's actually um, an LED. It's good for at night because it um, shows up where the phone is etc. 
but also um, from a technical perspective it gives you an indication about um, whether it's registered, whether it's not registered, etc. We'll cover that off later. Now this phone, the 40 ACR, is fundamentally an indoor phone. It can be used um, in an outdoor environment, but the only caution I would give you on that, or through it is um, resistive to weather, it has got a, an acrylic um, front plate on it, so if it's got direct sunlight hitting it, um, it's going to, over time, degrade, so just be aware of that. The feature set that we've got here, we um, have multiple uh, door access codes. Uh, we have got um, nine standard codes and we can actually use um, the speed dials, um, speed dialing memory slots for, for access codes as well. So that's 999, so there's plenty of access codes you can use. We can um, door open from any extension we so wish um, by dialing a, a door open code. With programmable day and night destinations, so depending if this, the phone is in day or night mode, it can dial two different plans if you so wish. Integration with local LAN and and voice over IP networks, cloud or local. <coughs> Pardon me. This is basically saying that we can integrate to a local IP PBX or soft switch, or head through to the cloud again because it's a standard SIP end device. Uh, we can manage it across the LAN, LAN WAN type environment um, and negotiate through NATs, etc. Network configuration DHCP or static, so you can um, have a static IP if you need for remote access, etc. Authorized registration with the existing voice over IP switching, SIP proxy. Automatic busy and disconnect detection, We've got 999 speed dialing memories again used for access control and or if we've got a multi-story apartment that we're dialing. Destination no answer call forwarding. This is a really quite a handy little feature so if it doesn't get answered it'll actually forward off to another destination. Day night weekly time profiles, um, seven days a week so whether so the actual access control phone can switch itself into day and night mode um, as it so wishes if it doesn't have a, a soft switch or it needs to manage that itself. So quite flexible, gives you a lot of options as well. Informative display, separate day and night destinations, e.g. if at night mode it needs to ring an off-site answer services, for example, if it's in a, um, if it's in a large tower block with um, no, uh, no night reception in a hotel type environment, uh, through the day there may be someone attending the front desk, but at night it goes to an after hours call center, so it does that exceedingly well. Uh, speed dial memory scrolling with the up and down keys, we can, that's what we can do with them. We have external buttons, now that's what that's saying basically is the external buttons are like an exit button, that type of thing, and that's using the two sensor ports that are on board, and again as we go through this presentation you'll see more information on that. Two separate door controls, which is equal to two relays. It's a PoE power over Ethernet uh, device, um, and generally I would say 99.9% .9 of all of these will be deployed that way. If you cannot for some reason use a PoE switch or a PoE injector, there is a 5 volt input that you can put an external power pack, which is 5 volts, 1.5 amps, that you can actually connect up to the phone and and power it up and just have a standard LAN network plugged into it. High quality speakerphone with um, web volume control. This is actually quite important. Yes, sure, you've got the volume, is it loud enough, is it not loud enough, but also as you're deploying these phones into um, either a closed environment or a big open environment, the voice uh, acoustics change, of course, so uh, the, the, the software control or the GUI control um, from the web browser allows you to change the um, the volume of the um, the speaker and or the microphone to get a nice balance. And we'll, as we go through the web interface, I'll, we'll show you where that is, so uh, you can see what that does. And we'll talk about that more. We've got a um, uh, it's, of course it's all web management GUI interface, so we can access it locally from a PC browser, but naturally also we can access it from a remote aspect. 
um, for customers that have got, again, multiple buildings, multiple sites, and they're all managing it from a centralized um, office or a centralized uh, control room, this is like the perfect thing in the world because you can just remote into it via browser, do any changes that you need, etc. And again, we'll be running through the browser later in this presentation. Has an integrated card reader, door status detectors that's using the sensors, we'll be talking about that later. Backlit display with a stylish design, of course, a bit of sales there for you. So as you can see, this is you can see the numbers here, but on this backlit photo you can see the back, backlit numbers um, showing up. Um, these things get their attention at night because they uh, actually look very spectacular in a, a darkened room. Uh, you'll see what I mean when you first install one of them. Uh, it's anti-vandal and tamper-proof with security alarm, case open alarm, that type of thing. Okay, so it'll notify if anything's happening there. Now, as we go through the two other models, there's some fundamental differences. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through all the features again. We'll just point out uh, the, the fundamental differences. So this is the Transtel IP3940PC. Okay, where the other one was a 40 ACR, this is a 40 PC. P, meaning piezo faceplate, which is actually like a thin metal plate, and C for camera. Okay, so fundamental differences between this one is just about identical to the 40 ACR except for A, it doesn't have a card reader. If you look down the, towards the bottom of the device, you'll see there is no sensor, um, there's no card indication that there's a, you, you swipe the card there. And the um, other thing is it's got the metal faceplate. So this is designed for indoor and outdoor use. This is, this is um, to handle a bit a harsh, more harsh environment. So it's all metal, stainless steel. And so the UV rays aren't gonna really affect this unit whatsoever. But of course, because it's metal, you can't have the um, the um, proximity cards or RF cards close to them. Apart from that, pretty much identical. Okay, it's weather resistance, but we'll um, talk about that in more detail later. Um, with the, the keypad, etc., and no backlit display. These numbers here, the black, as you can see, they're actually printed onto the stainless steel. The feature set, um, as you can see, is pretty much identical. Two things are missing is A, the backlit display, and B is the proximity card, or the RF card. But the feature set, just about identical to the 3940 ACR. The third and final model we're going to be looking at is the Transtel IP3941PC. Okay, the 40s have the dial pad, as in 40. The 41 means it only has one button. Or, yeah, and the one button is old Muggins here called the call, bell, call button. Okay, so it again is a PC, so it's a piezo. So it's got the middle fake plate, and it's got the camera. Okay, fully hands-free, of course. It can um, has all the LED, etc. The, again, the differences now is basically it's got no backlit display, it's got no dial pad, it's got no um, RF card, and it is weatherproof use for indoor outdoor use. If we look at the feature set, again, you'll see it is pretty much, again, similar. Again, these, these units, the one thing I will put out here while we're here, down the bottom, Outdoor weather resistance piece I keep keep out again. So it's weather resistant. Okay, we want to talk about a little about that when we get to the outdoor covers for it, and I'll explain exactly in detail what you can and cannot do with the um, the PC phones, the the piezo phones. Okay, moving along. Okay, so congratulations, guys. You're about to install. Transtel IP access control phone. So what comes with it? When you open the box, you should see the following. You have a set of install instructions. Now this is just, again, a supplementary note on top of the manual. The manuals are about decent, decent thickness, give you a bit of nighttime reading, put you to sleep. Um, but I do encourage you to read it because the more you read it, the more in-depth and you start actually understanding how this device works. And um, 
the uh, the Transtel access control phone is actually truly functional and flexible and you haven't seen anything yet because there's a few other bits and pieces coming. So anyway, getting back to what we should be talking about. We've got the install instructions here. We've got the mounting template there so you can know where to drill all your holes and that's all just folded up on top. You've got this nice, there's a bit of foam on the right hand side because it's a spare hole. And then you've got the actual uh, series phone that you've got. This is a IP3941 PC, no dollar pad. So you've got that there and then you've got a series of plugs, screws, etc. Getting the bits and pieces out of the um, out of the box, these are the uh, the spare bits floating around a little bit here. So you've got your screws and your wall plugs that you can uh, mount the unit with if you so wish. Um, whether or not you use them is entirely up to you. As we all know, each mounting situation is different from the last. We have terminal connector plugs for the relays, externals, um, connections and power supplies. What you do with the spare ones of these, if you leave them in the phone after you installed them or take them with you, it's uh, your call. Me, personally, I'll leave them in the phone. We have the Allen key, which is a um, special Allen key to open up the phone. Don't lose it. Um, keep that tucked away in a safe place. And then you'll also notice there is an RJ45 plug. Now, you'll uh, see what that one's for soon enough, because when we're talking, uh, talking about mounting and installing, we're going to go and have a little talk in depth about this. Okay, now we're going to talk about mounting of the access phones. Basically, there's three parts of mounting it. Um, you've got your plugs, etc. You draw your holes, you, you put them into the wall using your template. You've got your rubber seal here. This is probably one of the most critical, well, this is definitely one of the most critical areas to get right. The phone should be mounted on a nice, flat, even surface, okay, because part of this this whole rubber seal is part of just protecting the phone from moisture, protecting the phone from any damage, um, in ingress from insects, that type of thing. So <coughs> make sure it's on a, a flat and um, level surface so that you can um, you can um, mount it evenly. <coughs> Pardon me. Then we've got the um, you can see through here uh, on the rubber at the very bottom there is a little cross that's where the cable comes through and you've got two round holes in the metal plate and rubber that's the direction that your speaker is actually facing that'll come pretty clear in a later picture that we've got on the top of the metal plate we have got two little hooky hook bits that's where the actual main unit hooks on on the top and then swings in down and locks in down onto the bottom and you push it all firmly back onto the rubber and it seals around the black rubber and then you put your screw in. Okay, so mounting is important. Make sure that it is on a flat surface. Make sure that the environment that the phone um, is in suits um, the use of what you're going to do and what, what phone you're actually going to use. We do have an optional cover of which we will be talking about. Now we do advise um, if you're going to be using the um, the PC series phones out in the environment and even a um, ACR phone that if it's going to com come in contact with any um, external environment or e.g. is it going to get wet as in rain? The phones are quite adequate and work very well in your general rain, um, light rain scenario. Okay, but we just about would insist. I think it would be foolish if you didn't put a cover around it. Okay, these particular covers are, covers are Perspex, and you'll note. And if you look at the uh, left-hand picture for, on the very top of it, you'll notice it's a flat, um, a flat um, edge, and that is a flat edge because the camera needs to can't have anything bending down over the um, over the IP door phone because it'll actually block the camera. So we suggest you give it additional cover like anything in the environment uh, it can be gotten at. The phones are weather resistant. 
they don't have an IP rating but the internals are all covered in resin and all protected from moisture etc the rubber seals will actually seal the phone quite well but um, it the where I'm trying to go on this is basically don't hit it with a fire hose okay if you've got people who wash down buildings on a hose down area it's not gonna it's not gonna like that a heck of a well the um, and generally it's the pressure or the water or the, 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 the drenching of the water. So it's like any device, to be honest with you, unless it is specifically IP rated to IP64 or something and you will pay appropriately for that type of product. The, um, the Transtel phone is weather resistant, but um, do use caution. If it's going to be actually sitting out in the, the weather, to be honest with you, it probably under, under a hood it'll be probably fine. It'll be absolutely fine but just protect it from the environment as much as possible. Hardware details of the um, access phones. Let's have another closer look at them. Okay, so here is the actual phone and the, the rubber unit that actually is sealing everything. So we are looking at the phone so let's just look at the on the right hand side on where the actual rubber mat is where the phone mounts if you look at it carefully you can see that you've got the hole at the top and that's where the speaker mount has gone through and they've got two channels facing downwards okay that is to um, make sure that no water can head up and towards the speaker and that back part mounts against the wall, so hence why it's, it would be preferably on a nice, even, flat surface. Got the holes for the screws and a network cable slot. Now, if again, if we look at the back of the um, of the door phone, you've got a metal plate there, which you'll see in a better in the next shot. The speaker is actually a um, is a weatherproofed. Um, unit so of course naturally it's moving in and out like a speaker but it is um, water resistant or waterproof shall we say so if water hits it it isn't going to um, damage it but it is again it's part of a moving thing and like anything if any water gets in there we do have some problems so then we've got the further down we've got the MAC address etc information about the uh, the unit and then there's a hole beneath the MAC address and that's where your network cable will head in. You've got your case screw down the um, bottom, you'll see it down, down the very end. And just down the very end where it says case securing screw, you'll see just to the um, left of where it's pointing there's a little cable slot in there that's got a little rubber bung in it that can pop out and you can have a ingress into the cable at the bottom. And then on the right hand side of that, that's actually the microphone key. So, taking the, the external plate away, now we're looking on the inside of the phone. Now again, we've got our uh, speaker, got our speaker socket is actually unplugged from the back of the phone, so you can see where it plugs into the phone, got a network cable slot, and we've got our screw mount for to where the phone locks on. On the actual main phone itself, we've got all our top um, mount clips, that's how it clips onto the unit. We've got an SD card labelled in there, that's just for future use at this particular point in time, watch the space. We've got a relay control, uh, normally open, normally closed status. Um, we've got our LAN cable connection and we have got our microphone. Now, have a close look at this. <coughs> You'll see that if you look carefully at the circuit boards, they've got a resin coating across them, so they are very much protected against the weather. But again, you've got network cables, etc., in here which you need to protect. Um, and there are a few items that just will not like water getting in there. Again, it's weatherproof and it'll stop water getting in there, but don't hit it with torrents of water under pressure. E.g., someone doing a water blasting of a building is not a good idea. Just a few more details as we go through on the hardware. If you look at the top of the uh, phone there is a little switch saying default and normal. So this will actually enable us to go into a um, factory default scenario if, uh, for any reason. 
it's, it's not what I would call the normal un uh, switch that's going to be used every day because most of the defaulting will be done by the software but if you ever get yourself into a situation where the phone has been programmed, nobody knows the password, nobody knows how to get into it um, and you have to do a factory default, this is the hardware factory default and the it's pretty self-explanatory when you look through the instructions on how to do it which is also in the technical manual which this has been borrowed from the LAN connection I'm going to be talking a little bit about this it's very important okay this is a very compact designed access control phone for what it can do it's got a lot of punch packed into a little package okay so of course you've got a lot of electronics and um, processing power and and whatnot to make it all work so where I'm going with this is you've basically got only a certain amount of room to connect your network cable okay and like anything IT it's designed to be an IT device an IP device so it needs to be looked after and handled carefully and one of the, the big problems is damage through rough handling okay or handling that perhaps has not been thought through as well as it could have been okay so when you uh, first get your phone and you start having a look at it one of the things that you are going to notice is that it's got a very small area of connection so let's just move through these slots and I'll explain what the real problem is here's the real problem as you can see this is a standard LAN network cable with its um, own boot on it okay now also gives you a little bit more of proportion of the size of this access control phone versus a network cable this is this is a really a nice compact little unit now with a boot on it it just ain't going to work because what's happening here is that because you've got the boot rigidly holding the cable it's going to put tension on that um, network plug now it doesn't matter what model or what what type of network plug you're going to do there are some good ones and some some not so good ones but it's as soon as you start putting tension on it it's just like when you've got you've got your laptop and after a year or two of plugging things in and plugging things out and plugging things in and that's all got solid um, plastic around it and on your laptop and the plugs are just going in and out it's got very little tension or if you put too much tension on your laptop network cable it's actually going to damage the network connection and this is this is what I'm trying to flag here because it is a risk if you don't do it right it's it's you could damage the um, network cable and what you'll get is things like the PoE might not might be working but you can't talk you can't ping the um, IP phone okay so just just remember fundamentally the the access IP access control phone is just like a normal PC or a desk phone an IP desk phone you can ping it it's got IP addresses all that kind of thing so all through the phone fires up you can't ping it or the PoE drops off because one of the pins are bent because it's had tension sideways up down around whatever so it's really these network cables are a problem you need to be aware of it let's go through and look at a few more of these pictures again what's happened here is the person has now just done a termination onto the RJ45 into into the plug but they've actually put the um, the cable sensors or the cable sheath into the RJ45 and, and the um, and of course naturally the RJ45 is clamped down onto the cable now again because it's clamped down onto the sheath of the category 6 cable here it's going to form tension going backwards and forwards now at the moment this is all just coming out the bottom of the telephone imagine if that's trying to be twisted around just about 180 then trying to be popping out the back end of the phone okay oh sorry at the back end of the the, the rear access hole to out of the wall type cable so this is again going to cause problem it's going to cause twisting bending and initially it may not actually show up as a problem um, but three months six months later it could show up as a problem okay so where I'm heading with this is be very delicate or just you know, be gentle okay when you're putting things together 
um, don't let it hang. It's classic is this: someone plugs the um, plugs the IP um, door phone into the cable. Oh yeah, that's working. Then they let it hang off the IP the cable. That, that's that's a no no. Okay, the um, you just you support it if you're going to unplug it, unplug it gently, take it away, plug it back in. Okay, let's go and look at another example here. Okay, here's some things that are right. Okay, so what we're doing here, and hence why the um, phones come with RJ45 plugs, or an RJ45 plug, if, is that you can now just terminate directly into the RJ45. You'll notice on both these examples, on the Category 5 and Category 6, that the sheath have been removed and they're just terminated straight in. Now, if you want to, if you're worried about it saying, oh, well, it should be crimping down onto the actual wires in, in, in the plug, look at the example on the, uh, the right-hand side. You'll see that someone has actually um, cut a short length of uh, Category 5 sheathing so that that little crimper in the RJ45 can crimp right down onto it. Okay, so it's still holding the wires very stable inside the plug, but by move, when you're moving the, the um, Category 5 around, it's not going to cause any issues and tension, or more importantly, tension or twisting on that RJ45. So these are good examples of how to use them. Now, we've also will be including um, in these phones a new rubber little a little rubber unit here just to just to help you guide the the cables out. So the picture on the far left side here is basically the cable being crimped into the um, RJ45 clear plug. It's now plugged into the back of the phone and you can see the cables firing off to one side. Now by putting in this rubber unit which is designed just to fit in there nicely it just allows you to guide the cable around and give it a bit of support as it's going in there so the tension is off the actual silver part of the RJ45 socket on the circuit board and actually more transferring the tension to that rubber rubber area. Okay, The whole idea is to have a, a network cable um, so you can plug it straight into the, um, into the IP access control phone but if you need to test the network of course you can then unplug it and plug it into a laptop or something like that and test the network switching cable. So it's it's better than having a screw terminal type scenario in the term in the um, plug, but and allowing you to have the RJ45 plug. And in big writing down the bottom, do not allow the door phone to hang by its cabling. That is an absolute no-no. Okay. Put some support there. Step ladder with um, a flat top on it, a, a small stool, table, whatever. A long enough cable that you don't have to um, let it hang. But don't put the tension on there because we all, we've all done it. We've been sitting there trying to wire something up saying, oh no, we won't let it hang off the cable. We, we drop it, we hook it on something and the next minute it crashes up against the wall and you go, oh, it's still working, that's good. But it can damage these um, plugs, so be careful. Just one final other um, thing is when you are actually, and this is, yes it is relevant to this phone, the IP um, access control phones, but guys this is also just a, a, a general technical shout out there. When you are doing your own crimping, you know, we've all done it, um, we've had a, a cheap pair of crimpers, I've done it, you know, I remember I was a trainee and my phone beat me across the head many times about this, and saying, <coughs> If you can, you can over crimp. It doesn't matter if it's an RJ11, RJ12, RJ13, RJ45. If you get um, just a standard set of un, un um, oh, what, unstopped, shall we say, or not gauged um, crimpers, you can a big guy can really crimp down onto these plugs, and you can just about send those gold pins halfway through the pin and just about out the other side. Okay, halfway through the plug. So bear that in mind. This is the IT world, guys. If you don't have, if you know, people are going to need their own cables crimped. You're going to need to put RJ45s on or whatever. Invest in a good set of LAN connections, uh, can, uh, crimping pliers. Um, you know, tattoo your name on it. Don't care. Don't let it out of your sight. But 
it's in the long run it's going to save you callbacks and all that sort of thing because again the problem is and it doesn't matter if it's it's a, a transtel ip phone or a computer or anything else that you're doing out there camera if you crimp them in too hard and the and they're so far in that the gold pins can't get in the slot or or, or jammed because they're so far in you're going to have trouble with whatever device you're doing so you know Moral of the story, go easy on the crimping pliers and invest in a good set of pliers. Okay, let's talk about the external connections. Okay, so when we've got in the back of the phone, we've got the plugs that come with the um, Transtel IP39 phone. And they're pretty straightforward, they just plug straight into the back end of the phone. You've got your 5 volt DC, if, if you um, aren't going to use your PoE. You've got sensor 1, sensor 2, your relay, relay 2, and you have an audio out plug. So, with your PoE, make sure that you are 802.3 AF compliant. Um, you can use either a standard PoE switch or PoE injector. <laughs> Just be aware of PoE switches. A lot of the PoE switches over, over there are underpowered and in many cases. Now, I'm, I know I'm only meant to be talking about a Transtel IP3940 a device and it's just one device okay but generally when you're doing a deployment like this it could be an access control phone it'll be voice over IP phones it'll be it could be IP paging it could be all sorts of things double check with whatever PoE that you're going to use that a it's a reputable brand and I'm not saying that it has to be a Cisco I'm not saying that it has to be the most expensive out there but a mid-range PoE switch is a good one get to know a good one get to use it one you trust and keep on using it but also please look at the power output, the wattages that the PoE can handle and particularly if you're using it just about for pure voice over IP or voice and, and everything's PoE just make sure that your total wattage added up of all the different PoE devices and they're all different um, don't overload the capability of the PoE switch okay trick for young players sorry just bringing it out because um, we have a number of support issues at times, um, and you know they they try and use a, an IP paging device, and as soon as they turn it over halfway volume, the device restarts, and that's purely because the PoE switch isn't has just run out of oomph to drive it, because the wattage that the PoE device is demanding outstrips all of the equipment, the total of all the equipment plugged into that IP address. I hope that makes sense. Um, you've got your five volt rail there, which we've talked about, which is 1.5. Uh, amps 5 volts. We've got our sensor ports, external, and we can put external switches etc on them. Um, we've got a second switch, we'll be going through various scenarios there. We've got our relay 1, relay 2, and we have our um, normally closed, normally open switch. So again this is another configuration that you could put onto the phone, so we've got a uh, PoE switch going into um, a router, just a different set of graphics we've got here. We've got an external, one of the sensor ports going to an external button so you can get out. So you could like enter a pin number to go into the door, but then you could have a button that you simply press to exit and away you go. And then we've got a the second sensor using the sensor on a magnetic a mag lock to see if the door is open and or closed. So that would be used in an environment where someone goes open gets let in the door but then they put a little block of wood in there to let their mates in afterwards or rob the place or whatever this um, the transtel phone uh, access control phones can be set up say after 15 or 25 seconds to actually alarm and let uh, somebody know that the um, the door is not closed is not closed um, then we're using relay one here to open up a uh, standard switch lock and you'll notice it's just got a power supply. Now they are dry contact relay so they don't actually supply um, any power to drive the lock so just bear that in mind so you always need a uh, need a low voltage power to drive the um, 
block control. Moving along. The AP phone. The AP phone, access phone, LED indications. This is the light that we have got down here, the LED panel. Okay, That's probably a good way to do it, uh, to describe it. It has various functions. So, when the door phone is on and ready and idle status um, and its SIP is all registered is up, it is permanently on. If the network is down, it is permanently off. If the registration and the SIP has failed, it is permanently off. If um, outgoing dialing conversation, slow flashing, relay work, slow flashing, fast flashing, power is on but door is not ready and not uh, it hasn't entered into idle mode, so there's an issue on it. Software update is occurring, fast flashing. APS update and software, fast flashing. Save and reboot, fast flashing. Set to factory default, procedure runs, fast flashing. Unit restarted, fast flashing. Remote restart operation or from remote server, fast flashing. Generally, anything fast flashing means the phone's not working, or if it's off, it's not working. Okay? Pretty straightforward, but it gives you an indication at a glance what could be happening to the system. System being, of course, the access control phone. Okay, let's have a look at using the sensors and relays on the access control phone. Okay, so we can use it for serialized door open. I apologize for the spelling mistake I've just noticed, but it doesn't matter. This is serial door opening. Basically all it is, is that there is two sensors controlling two phones and the phone is actually controlling the relays and the sensors. So access to um, the phone here and the door can open here so I can, so I ring an internal party, okay, internal party says yes come on in and they open up door number one and then the door number one closes and then only when the door number one closes can door number two be opened. So even if I try and access or tell it to open door two until that door one is shut it will not open. I hope that makes sense. Um, so essentially it's, it's, it's sort of gang controlling the doors. One door has to be shut and secure before the other door opens. You can think of various configurations like that um, Oh, years ago in another life I used to service money counting machines and to get into um, it was Armour Guard we're actually working, doing work for had this identical situation they let us in the first door the door had to be shut, secured the guards were looking at us through um, um, bulletproof glass and taking their sweet time to open the second door but that second door would not open until the first door was shut I hope that makes sense for you We have got um, a combination of using the external sensors and relays to <coughs> open the doors and either via pin numbers and or just pressing a button. For example, if we are looking at the far right hand side, we've got uh, sensor 2, relay 2. Relay 2 opens up door 2 uh, via pin number swipe card or somebody uh, dialing the access code to let, uh, let you in. And or if I'm going out the door, I press the door release key and it fires the lock and lets me out. Okay, again, pretty simple, straight up and down operation. Generally, just just as a comment, generally um, one access control phone is going to be controlling one door, um, and you might have a door release for um, leaving. But I would say 95% of the time that's what you'll be using. Okay, but got various combinations here we can use. Using HTTPS commands via Ethernet network on an access phone. This is actually quite an exciting side of things. The at the moment the um, the Transtel IP39 series, the 40 series phones have been um, released, and they can actually control each other. Okay, but uh, this opens up Pandora's box a little bit, and you'll see more and more stuff coming out as the months roll forward. But essentially, just to explain it, what we've got here is an outside phone sitting on the network, 
and it has got no physical connection to the door lock or to control of the door lock whatsoever. If I walk up there and I swipe my card on it, it will actually send a, a command, an HTTPS command, through the LAN network to the second internal unit. And that internal unit will recognize it as, oh, that's a, it's a um, verified command, I will unlock the door. So that means that the unit that is actually controlling the lock is internal. Okay, this is not new. It is out on the market. It's um, uh, it's not cheap. So um, by, by any stretch of the imagination, but it, it allows a, a, a lot more control. Now I can see the future of this because we can actually start controlling all the locks and all the um, all the phones by a simple push of a button on a um, on a voice over IP phone with a DSS console. So, <coughs> but that's coming. That's that's just a, a comment I flew in there for the threw in there for the the future. At the moment, what is released and ready to work is a Transtel door phone controlling a Transtel door phone. Okay, pretty straightforward. It's um, reliable, works well. You've got your internal uh, phone with another phone sending a command to it via the um, via the, the LAN or WAN network to open and control it. This is a simple example, but those of you who come across opportunities and we will be giving um, more demonstrations on uh, solutions as the time goes on. Okay, the IP phone's main functionality. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Fundamentally, guys, the Transtel IP door phone, or the IP3940 series phones, are just a SIP phone. You know, if you just look at it from its fundamental basics, as in installing and supporting it, it's a SIP registration on a telephone. Okay, It can have an extension number, it can have a external registered number to a um, cloud-based telco. Okay, or extension, whatever, it doesn't matter because that's the technology and in the industry that we're in now. Okay, you can make calls, you can receive calls. Okay, on top of that, we're laying in the access control and security and camera aspect of it. And as we go through this presentation more and more, you'll see more of this coming through, and hopefully, you'll get more ideas of it. But let's just talk about from what can we use it for. It can be integrated through to a IP PBX soft switch <coughs> as a simple SIP extension. Okay. Now, because we're connecting to a, PB, a PBX or a soft switch of some description, not only do you have the power of the programming of the IP39 Transtel, you've also got the combination of the programming of a, a SIP PBX type or soft switch type environment as well. Let your mind wander on that one. <laughs> you can do ringing control, management control, and you can do all sorts of things with it. Okay, so or through even the um, the Transtel can have its own ringing patterns day and night. So can the PBX. So can the um, so can the soft switch. It's, uh, so can the cloud. So it's horses for courses. I, I would say that most well, any one installation is, is going to be pretty much unique in regards to um, how you want to set it all up. On top of that, the just to throw this in as a sidewinder as well for you, the phone actually doesn't need a um, soft switch. The IP3940 um, series phones do not need a soft switch, soft PABX, or a hosted cloud solution to work. In a closed network environment, in a building, um, for example, we can have <coughs> the phones using their address books to actually individually call and communicate to the other devices, phones, endpoints, IP3970 um, panel, tablets, etc., in the apartments, all directly. They don't actually need uh, a combination of um, a PABX to do it. Okay, uh, but the f it's rudimentary operation, e.g. it's calling and, and communicating and opening doors. If you want a little bit of extra um, management and um, manipulation of calling patterns and all that sort of thing, that's when you start needing to use soft switches. So, horses for courses, when you read through the manual, 
and you'll start getting a hang of where, where we're going. Next point, we can connect it directly to uh, a PABX or via hub router switch, etc. Okay, so again, doesn't matter if we've got a um, if we've got a local PABX or a, a remote PABX or a, a telco cloud-based PABX, we can easily do. Um, we can pretty much connect to anything. Unit dials is predefined by day and night destinations, which is great. <coughs> Um, and it's automatic day and night to manage that. The unit um, can dials to local extensions and external extensions. Doesn't matter if it's uh, three or seven or nine digit numbering, it'll um, dial out through. The unit uh, uses pre programmed destinations using speed dial directory. This is actually hugely important if you are um, looking at like a closed um, uh, gated community would be one example, or um, a large apartment, I'm thinking of, um, what am I thinking of, Gold Coast perhaps, you've got a lot of um, apartments, um, multiple rooms, 30, 40 rooms, uh, multi-storey buildings, I'm sure they're bigger, it doesn't matter, uh, you've got one of the IP3940 ACR sitting in reception downstairs, or, um, or outside, you can then scroll, you can just press a call button, and go straight to the reception and during the day there might be a reception in one of these buildings at night it goes to a, um, a centralized control building that manages all these buildings because a lot of them are all un unattended at night the um, then they can open up the door and let you in etc and manage it or if you want to call somebody it's uh, actually an apartment building and I want to scroll up and I know I'm in apartment uh, 217 I can scroll up and down through the um, through the speed dial list by searching and find apartment 217, call it, and then it appears on my IP3970 um, tablet um, tablet phone, and I can see video and talk to you and let you in and that type of thing. So, flexible, <coughs> a lot of opportunity. Just need to work through what you what you wanted to do. Unit calls call forwarding options of primary destination does not answer. So if you, again, we've talked about that a little bit before, where we just sort of, it rings and it's got an alternate answer position. The unit can manually um, open and exit building by pushing a press button, uh, push, pushing a button. We've talked about that already. That's the, the sensor button we talked about. The unit opens a door from a local extension's remote destination, such as a cell phone. Now, this is could be an interesting point for, for example, if I'm the um, the maintenance engineer or the manager or the the general lackey in a building who looks after a whole bunch of apartments, maintenance person, and <coughs> when someone calls me on my desk phone or my phone in my office or my workshop, wherever I am, and I don't answer, it can then be forwarded off to my cell phone if necessary. And um, then I can answer that and then it might be a contract that I'm waiting for, an air conditioning contractor, and I might go, yeah, fine, whatever, come on in, and um, I'll let you in, and I can open up the door from my cell phone. Okay, what else we got here? Door opens using external buttons, got that, unit managed by web GUI, etc. So, yep, that's all covered off. Moving on. Door opening codes. Okay, so this this diagram here is basically telling us here's your IP phone, there's your door locked, there's your um, LAN that the phone's connected to, and there's your SIP extension, and you've got a proxy server sitting over there, soft PABX or whatever you want to call it, cloud, doesn't matter. Two ways you can get into this. I can walk up and I can enter a PIN number or an access code number, and the phone acknowledges it and opens up the door. Easy peasy. Okay, so we have got code 1 through to 9 here, relay 1, relay 2. So, door opening code 4321. If I dial that on this phone here, it's going to open up relay 1 and open up that door. If I dial 69876, uh, it's going to open up the second relay on the door. Okay, so we can have various codes for relay 1 and relay 2. Now that's just the standard 9 section. I'll, I'll flag just down on the bottom note on the left hand side is that um, 
we can use the additional 999 access codes on the speed dial system and we'll actually see that when I go through the um, online programming and we can basically use them as pin codes for day one for, for day, uh, sorry for relay one and relay two so for example if I've got 900 or five looks, looks to be reasonable let's say 500 residents um, um, uh, or in a gated community and I want to give them um, codes for the gates or whatever I can give them all of these different codes and a code assigned per name and who's got it and who's accessed it and all that kind of thing so uh, instead of and so with the 999 plus the 9 that's essentially 1008 access codes that you can have on this um, unit um, this uh, last section or the second to last section on the right hand side of that screenshot is door opening from extension code 1, door opening from extension code 2. They are essentially two codes that you can use. Now that's if somebody dials from the door phone through to the SIP extension or uh, a cell phone. Uh, the moment I dial 5 and it opens up relay 1, if I had something else programmed in uh, relay 2 slot it would allow me to open and I've got a, a various sets of codes that I've dialed to let them in. The door opening prefix code um, the star that that's basically telling us um, that when when I dial a pin number on the um, Transtel access phones, um, I don't really want my number coming up. Say for example, I've got a really secure hot number four three two one. That's like nobody's ever going to guess that. Okay, and I don't want people to see it when I'm dialing. So if I'm dialing four three two one on the keypad. It's actually going to, because that's set to star, it's actually going to go star, 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 star. Okay? It's doing that because A, I don't want anybody over my shoulder looking at me while I'm dialing it and seeing what my number is. And B, it's a comfort signal sign that I'm actually seeing something coming up on the screen. Okay? We can make it stars, hashes, or you can have nothing at all. Totally up to you. Okay? So that explains that part of it. We have a case opening alarm if somebody um, tinkers with the um, unit and tries to open it up or uh, force it open etc it will send off a um, a warning call and, and notify the, the the operators or the people who are looking after the management of the phone okay accessing the programming You do all the programming on the um, IP3940X series via browser. Okay, When you plug it in, how it works is if I take uh, a standard phone out of a box and I plug it into a network with a DHCP running, a phone will run off and go and get allocated its own DHCP. Okay, Not a problem. The question is how do we find the IP address? There is two ways of doing this. One of them is that you go to the phone and press the P slash key, dial 1, the access administration number, which is 1234 by default, and then hash, and it will display the IP address on the display. Okay? That's one way of doing it. The other way is we use some scanning software, which we'll talk about later, to scan the network and see if we can find the um, IP phones. Another way is that if you want to just plug in the phone, the IP um, access phone, into a PoE injector or something like that and it doesn't have a DHCP um, enabled on that part of the network, e.g. it's just standalone doing nothing, it will, first of all, the phone will go looking for the DHCP server. If it can't find it, it's going to default to IP address 10.10.10.6, so 10.10.10.6. Okay, and then you can actually log into the, the phone. Now, a, the screenshot of the actual browser here, I've just taken the, the, the top bit off, that's actually in my office. So, um, I, the IP address it actually f um, had was 10.18.150.53. Okay, and that is your login screen that you will see. Just taking one step back here. <coughs> 
this is about if you go up to the actual telephone and we've talked about the default, default being 10 10 10 6 if we don't have a DHCP but if you do have it deployed on a DHCP active network it can be a little bit tricky finding the um, the IP address has been given so basically the method number one as I've already des described to you you press the P slash key dial one the web, the web access administrator code which is by default 1234 and please um, and then it gives you the screens of once you're dialing that it shows the inputs then once you do the input the password and hash there's the IP address and if you noted um, from the previous slide that was the IP address in my office so that's what the IP address that was showed on on the telephone okay pretty straightforward the other alternative that you can use is um, use a free piece of software from Transtel and that is to use a network scanner um, called phone scan and that will basically go looking and find all the G um, the um, Transtel manufactured products and um, have a look and this particular one is actually showing a couple of um, a couple of GDS systems okay using syslog to um, record door opening and activity the IP door phones can actually um, send information through to um, third parties and or its own server which hasn't been released yet <coughs> giving uh, reports and details of activities and, and what pin codes were used and all that kind of thing so I've just done a, a little bit of a quick um, set up here just to show you what what it, what it can do so this is just using a syslog watcher and it's connected up to the um, the access control phone and really all it's doing here is sending information about the date this where it, the source IP um, the time the door phone information whether the doors open what codes were used etc 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 in a practical sense it's not um, ideally practical at this point in time but watch this space because the um, if you've got a an existing third-party um, um, management system if if that system can handle syslog and receive it from the um, trans phone it can pull out all the the details and records etc that it needs to but the trans is also going to be releasing its own ver server and management system for um, for devices so can't go into it in great detail here but just watch watch the space and we'll um, you'll see me be seeing more information on that technical information basically I just threw this slide in here just to give you um, a little bit of information about the um, the phone if you want all the technical information have a good solid read of the manual and um, it'll give you everything you need to know only a couple of um, warnings or comments I would make is that like all IP devices phones cameras PCs whatever if it's sitting on a LAN network the maximum distance you're going to be able to run from a um, PoE switch or from a network switch is going to be a hundred meters so <coughs> the joys of um, uh, networks is that if you've got a, a very large building or multi stories generally nowadays you're going to start getting fiber in between the uh, the switches the fiber uplinks um, EPON systems there's all, there's all sorts of uh, technology out there now and then they'll have a PoE switch in a um, in a rack room or in a cupboard somewhere and all your devices will come off that so just just bear that in mind um, yeah so but just a little bit of technical information there for you but have a good look at the um, at the manual programming okay in this section I'm just going to be going through the programming um, on and actually it's going to be uh, live recordings of me in an actual Transtel phone just just showing you what certain parts are doing again okay so let's go through the uh, programming of an IP door phone now this is uh, presentation is basically just going to go through and give an overview of each uh, what the various parts of the command structure of the phone do there is a full technical manual that you can read through and get information on
So to access the browser, basically you load in the um, IP address of the phone, and then the login is admin, lowercase, and the default password is 1234. Press send. We're now logged into. Now, this is basically the home page. It's going to be giving you a whole bunch of information about the telephone. So it's telling us that it's an IP3940AC. A is standing for acrylic front and C standing for camera. Okay, um, this particular model also has the uh, scanning ability or the, the proximity cards, um, so for access control as well. So we'll be running through that. The uh, software version is EO2 ABW 0403, telling you the software date, the um, C, uh, KPU version, which is the um, uh, hardware type version we've got, the MAC address, unique uh, MAC address of this particular unit. The IP address it's sitting on, it's registered on extension 301, and its current status is registered. Okay, the next section we're going to have a look at on the side menu here is the network. So, underneath the network is a bunch of uh, subcategories, and so the first one we're going to look at is the LAN. Okay, by default, the uh, system is set for DHCP, so essentially when you plug it into a, a PoE adapter and you have a DHCP running on your network, the unit will start up and um, go and get a um, DHCP or a um, IP from the DHCP. So in this case it's got 10, 18, 150, 54. If you uh, do fire or power up the unit, and um, using a PoE and it has not got uh, a DHCP on the network, the, uh, the IP door phone will look for DHCP, but then if it can't find it, it will then default back to what its fixed IP is set to. Now by default, this is 10.10.10.6. So once the unit has started um, and it can't find DHCP, you can actually talk to it using 10.10.10.6. Naturally, you would have a um, crossover cable to talk directly to it or um, have a um, PC that is automatic detect on its LAN port. But you would set um, your PC up to a fixed IP of 10.10.10.10 with um, a subnet of the same of the phone and IP gate, uh, IP 10.10.10.1 um, for the gateway. And then you could actually browse directly to the um, phone and program it and set it to a new set IP etc. If you are going to uh, run just a fixed IP on your network um, you would put your um, IP address, subnet and default gateway in there but also don't forget to use your DNS um, servers which are suitable for your network. Okay then after that we've generally got just um, such things as NET, uh, NAT transversal, the uh, stun servers, etc. Got uh, HTTPS um, options for activation. We do have auto provisioning options here. Now this can be done through um, using uh, HTTP, um, HTTPS and an HTTP server. Uh, whether it be an, uh, you can enable it and then run through for username, passwords, etc. You could also um, download config files and or um, set update files through to it. And then you've got your RTBS options. For these settings, I'm not going to go into great detail because they're more advanced network settings. Um, generally, on a, on a standard install, you, you're not going to use these. Uh, the main settings that you're going to be worried about is for 99% 0.9% of the installers and deployment are going to be your just your LAN settings and DNS, fixed IP or DHCP, whatever you're going to do. So these are more uh, advanced networking provisions and more advanced um, auto provisioning. Some people will be interested in that. Um, it's more details in the, the manual and or you can contact us to discuss this. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at is under the SIP side menu here. So we're going to just have a, a brief overview of each, each option here. So if we go on and click our account, this is basically the account section uh, on, the, um, 
on the unit. Now <coughs> we've got a multi-account option here. Um, by default it's disabled so that means we've just got one SIP registration account but we do have an option here to enable it. Now if we do that now if we drop down to the number of accounts we've got up to five and if I go and click account number two it will update and there's account number two. Now it's not set up on this particular phone but I can go to account number three and away it goes and I can just head back to account number one it'll refresh and we go back to account number one. What this is for is so that we can have multiple SIP accounts running, so that multiple calls, or sorry, so that calls can be made out on made out on multiple ITSPs, whether it be a cloud, a PABX, or uh, any preferred unit. And then within the phone books internally on the system, which we'll be covering off later, oh, I'm sorry, the internal phone phone books, as in the speed dials in the actual IP door phone. We can actually tell certain co certain um, phone numbers to dial out on on different account numbers. Okay, and that'll come clearer uh, as we go through. But at this stage, we're just going to disable that one. So our door phone number is 301 in this particular case, which is a SIP registration. It's got a display name three um, display name 301. It's going to do authentication 301, and the password um, for this particular unit. Um, there's only a three digit because I've been cheating a wee bit on this one. But let's just spend a bit of time talking about passwords on SIP. As a golden rule, um, I would suggest you have at least a ten digit password, um, alphanumeric um, at least. Um, the reason being is that with, with any SIP device or any SIP network, there are people out there who aren't quite as nice as they could be and they're trying to hack and get in there so we're in, in the world of IT we need some some robust security and robust passwords so don't use a simple password don't use a low digit no one two three four type password keep it um, alpha word, um, letters and numbers okay write it down remember it don't lose it um, but um, yeah be security conscious when it comes to voice over IP, of course. Um, we then got our domain server. Now you'll notice on this one I've got a colon 5070 here. Now that's because on this particular um, site, um, my office, um, we use 5070 as our uh, registration port for internal SIP extensions. If I was just going to be using port 5060, I don't have to put that in. I could just simply put the IP address in very much like this. Okay, um, so from a default perspective, the, the the phone just likes 5060 because that is the the, the um, basically the standard. But because I am using a different port, and some servers, particularly um, cloud servers, etc., are going to be using different ports out in the uh, the real world, you can point the phone at a different port by simply going colon and then the port number. This is where you put your um, proxy server address if you're using that type of setup and this is the status of the phone and at the moment saying it's registered. So we just apply that and that heads right through. Then we click under the ports. Now again this I've got set at 5070 uh, because that's what it is in my um, office but by default that's what it would look like 5060. Okay um, so I'm just changing it back because that's my office. And then we've got our RTP ports start and end. Now, by default, again, this is suitable for um, the system that I've got uh, running in my office, but you could change this if necessary because of either a um, network requirement, depending on the telco that you're connecting to, um, or the um, hosted PABX type scenario, depends what ports they want to do because they will want to run RTP through different uh, firewall firewalled and open ports on the router and or um, the different um, IP PBXs uh, or soft switches that you have on premises or could also want to have different ports okay fundamentally internally into internal traffic e.g. you're sitting across the the LAN this isn't going to make a great deal of issues but if you are going to be connecting to an external uh, hosted cloud-based uh, or um, telco-based um, provider, uh, be aware that you will have to, could have to get the information um, from, from the server.
service provider. So we just go and apply that one, so it's your port settings. We're then going to hit your audio codex. Pretty straightforward, um, priorities of audio codex and what, how many do you want it to be able to select. Now, on the IP door phones, we basically got these um, options on the codex. So we've got a um, PCMU and PCMA. That's eff effectively G711A and G711U. Okay. Um, pretty standard out there. We've got uh, G722, if uh, your equipment's um, capable of that, that's the HD. G729 for um, a lower uh, speed, um, sorry, lower um, demand codec. If you've got a bandwidth issue, then you've got the, uh, the speed 32, 16 and 8K, and of course GSM. So I'm just going to put that back there. Um, and you can have up to eight priorities if you, you so wish. So once you've done that, you again hit apply. Don't forget to hit apply once you've done any changes because otherwise it's not going to remember it. And there's another little thing we need to talk about later. Um, now we're going to go for video codecs. These are the two video codecs that the um, IP phone supports and you can then select the priority that you'd like them in and these are the two payload types. Generally, unless there's a reason why you'd be changing this, you would leave this at default. Okay, so we don't need to hit apply, so we're fine there. And now we're going to hit our advanced settings. And this is now going to talk about the SIP registration. Okay, again, this is very much dependent on the either the PABX and or um, Telco. Some don't care. Um, the um, default setting on this, I believe, is 60. Uh, in my case, I've just set it to 180, so it's 180 seconds, 180 seconds. If I wanted uh, some telcos I know over that I deal with, they like it sitting at 3600, uh, which is basically an hour. But in my case, we're just going to go 180. Okay, and that's what it's going to stay at. Now, um, Dialing DTMF mode. This is basically the options that it'll go for. It'll use RFC 2833, SIP info, or in band DTMF. Now, uh, my preference is RFC 2833. Okay, the reason being is that it's to me it's the most reliable way to get the DTMF uh, across the network because it's um, in the um, the VoIP stream then, as in it's, um, it's, it's actually a uh, it's a data packet, it's not um, DTMF or anything like that, um, and it's probably the most reliable. But in saying that, um, I have come across um, cases on uh, various other networks and whatnot that SIPINFO is the preferred method and or in-band. It very much depends on the, the network you're dealing with, but if you want something that is uh, robust and reliable and will work across uh, a good majority of what's out there, RFC 2833 is the way to go, and mainly because we will be dialing digits across, um, the DTMF digits across the, uh, the network to control the phone, etc. Um, the session timer is enabled, so we just simply put that and we go apply and that saves it. Now, just one little note, and we'll start reminding you, once you've finished doing all this programming and you've finished um, pushing apply, a save and reboot will actually write all of this to the memory of the, of the um, IP door phone and it will restart and uh, all the settings are, are saved. If you um, need to do this to enable or enact all of the settings you've changed. Okay, the next section we're going to have a talk about is the telephony section. So let's have a look at this. This is the parameters. So these are just some basic uh, telephony uh, parameters. First of all is the auto answer. Three options, disable, enable and intercom. Basically, when you ring the phone, this uh, tells the phone, does it just ring? And then you've got to press the call button to answer it. And if that's the case, you would sit in on disabled. Or if it just uh, rings, it's going to answer um, any, any call, whether that um, be internal or external. Um, so it will uh, beep and then it'll answer. And then you've got intercom. Now, Generally, you would just use the enable because 
the, any ringing is going to be controlled by the um, the cloud or the soft switch or IPPBX that you are connected to. Some PABXs can control and send forward information on whether it's an internal or external call. Okay, that's when you would use an intercom if you wanted that. That means it would ring on a um, external call, but if it was an intercom, in, intercom call, it would auto answer. Um, very much a Pacific um, um, soft switch cloud or um, PBX um, feature. So as a rule, to keep it simple. I would simply use if you wanted an auto answer, use enable. Next one is outgoing call sender send answer mode. It is disabled again on some devices. You could actually send forward um, a request um, on calling that the other end automatically answers. Again, it's a um, Pacific um, Pacific feature or function of the um, soft switches that you're dealing with. So, but by default that is disabled. Hash is ending of dialing it is enabled. Pretty straight straightforward for voice over IP. Um, essentially you dial the extension number then press hash to tell the phone I've finished dialing you can now send it out and away you go. Um, by default enabled. Um, keypad direct dialing to destination is enabled which is now enables you to actually dial the extension numbers and that kind of thing enabled and disabled options. Interdigit dial out you dial an extension number or a phone number on the um, or speed on the speed number on the um, phone, it waits for three seconds and then dials out. You can change that if you wish, but the standard setting is three seconds. Maximum conversation, quite a handy little beast. Um, fundamentally, that says how long can you actually talk once you've called. For example, if this is a door phone sitting um, um, on your front door and then you ring a um, telephone, we can tell it that ring and once it gets answered the, converse, the the call will stay up for one minute and then drop out okay um, and you can go through to two hours if you so wish really when you're doing, ringing another uh, voice over IP phone or another um, um, video device and you've got an answer generally if, if the person hangs up or um, it will release the call and clear down but let's hypothetically say that um, someone's got a video panel, they answer it, and then they forget to, to push the hang up and nobody tells their door phone to hang up, um, or it's a cordless phone voice um, device and they forget to hang it up, the phone will just hang up, will just simply stay online until um, it gets told to hang up. So this is a timer, so we can make it two minutes or one minute. If it's just sitting as a basic door phone, one minute probably would be um, fine and the call can be um, cleared down automatically releasing the phone for further use and or um, you can re-establish the call. Then we've got a uh, no answer timer so that if the um, if uh, the door phone doesn't answer within um, say 20 seconds as your timer's down there we can then set a destination for it to, to redirect to another destination. Okay, once we've finished um, changing any setting here again, press apply. Our day and night settings <coughs> I basically can put the door phone into a, a day and night mode. Okay, it's uh, an additional feature on top of um, your soft switch and or IPPBX. You might have it controlled um, uh, by the PABX or the um, or the, uh, the carrier, but if it isn't, you can now set up a, um, a day and night mode. So at daytime from 8.30 to 5.30 is daytime. <coughs> Monday, 8.30 to 5.00. So you can set up a, um, a, a time, and or you can control it manually here. So if it was manual, you can then use this to set it backwards and forwards to day and night. But if it's automatic, we can basically use these timers on the phone on a seven day a week time schedule. Then under here we have got um, a day destination and a night destination. At the moment it's been told to ring uh, a hunt group which is on this system which is 400 and it's using SIP account number five. Now earlier in the presentation under SIP we were discussing that you can have either a single and or up to five. Now here's a case where we might use it where we're going to use during the day 
a um, PABX if I can't, but at night we might use a, a MyNet phone or a TwoTalk account so we could change that to two and then, then we could put a phone number here, full blow-in phone number there and away we go. So and it's using two separate SIP accounts. So part of the flexibility of this TransTel unit. We'll just change that back to 400. And again, save. Then we have our speed dials. Now there is um, many options you can use this for and essentially it's a speed dial where we can have a destination destination day and a destination night um, using um, the different speed dials. Um, a call forward, a no answer destination, a door opening code um, and the different destinations using the various SIP accounts again through 1 to 5. Okay. The um, and then the user dial number, e.g. what code they're going to dial to make this all work. In a, in a nutshell, the second, this is basically if you're going to dial a code and you've got um, multiple tenants, hundreds of them, because it goes up to 999 speed dials, we can have all the different um, dial codes, etc. that people, um, the users dial on their um, areas, we can have it ringing different destinations with timeouts and callouts um, so that um, we might have a, an apartment um, XYZ we've got a code that we dial um, let's say 4001 and that it might ring a destination day which could be an extension um, um, in the apartment um, but at night it could be a um, another um, destination if we so wish but that one could be um, using a different hunt group, a different um, various different um, options of what you can do. But one of the biggest uses this is generally going to be used for is for additional pin codes. And for example, we could put it um, at the, by standard. There's uh, approximately ten. Um, pin codes that you can enter and we'll be covering them also as we, we come to them but these are additional ones so we might have 344113 or whatever um, that's an opening code and can we use it the keypad? Yes we can and then we can type in that it's um, Steve's code if we so wish and then I could put a another one in okay and I can enable that as a, pin, as a, a keypad code and that's Bob's code. Okay, so that gives us, um, and that's not how you spell Bob, so we'll just do that. Um, so then again, we um, save and apply, um, and we can now add up to um, 999 additional codes and all different ringing destinations as you so, so see fit. Again, once we have finished doing all the changes, we do a save and reboot. Now, through at each end of each section, I'm saying that you must do a save and reboot. You could uh, program the whole um, phone before you do a save and reboot. Okay, the next section we're going to do is door functions. First section, parameters. Opening door time. This is the timer that's basically going to tell the relay how long to remain closed, e.g. put power through to the external lock. By default it is 4 seconds and you can set it through up to 10 if you so wish. Your open door timeout is used in conjunction with a sensor port. You would have a sensor on the top of your door so that if the door is closed the, sen the relay would be closed for example when it's open the relay would open. This is the timer to tell the uh, access control phone when to alarm if the door remains open too long for them to notify the day and night ringing um, positions that the door has remained open too long. Discon disconnect call timer after opening is disabled. In this position when you make an int a call to the internal party or the person who's going to let you in, they dial their code the door will open, the call will still remain there so they can still talk to you and you can still talk to them. 
the internal party hangs up, the call is cleared down. If this is enabled, now the call, when it is made, the internal party will answer it, and as soon as they dial the open code on their phone, the call will be disconnected. Door access codes. On top of your nine entries here, one through to nine, you have got another 999 pin codes or open codes in your speed dial section. This is your standard setup on a, a normal phone. If you need anything above and beyond what's here, you could use your speed dial entries, the 999 speed dial entries that are on board the access control phone. Essentially you've got control of relay number one and relay number two. You can have a code for relay one and a code for relay two so that they can be very much managed and balanced by the customer and you can have up to nine of them. Straightforward, you just enter whatever codes you want in there and then whatever if they are dialed on the phone they will unlock the um, unlock the door. Then you've got your door opening from extension codes and again you've got two of them and one each for each relay so you control each individual relay individually. As we scroll down the page now we have got your opening code prefix. This is essentially a mask so as you dial your code, your access code on the door phone it'll actually bring up stars. So if I've got one, two, three, four as my access code, it'll actually appear on the phone as star, 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 star. Reason for this, number one, it gives the um, person who's dialing in an indication that they have dialed a digit correctly. And number two, anybody who's standing near them cannot see the PIN number that is being dialed. The options are you can have stars, hashes, or nothing at all. Okay. Digit hash at the end of the opening code pretty self-explanatory if you've got 1234 as your opening code in this disabled position after you finish dialing the 4 1234 the, the relay will fire and the door will open if you have it enabled you now need to go 1234 hash and then then the um, lock will open then we have got this section here now this is going to take a little bit of reading for you because it's a very deceiving little command. This actually controls the HTTPS protocol um, opening um, other door phones across the um, Ethernet. There is a section, we discussed this earlier in the presentation, this is what it relates to, so if um, you are interested in this, have a good read of the manual because it's about five pages of documentation to go through. It's a great little um, feature and it works very well, so you just need to do a little bit of study on it. That ends this section. Okay, moving on to the next section, which will be system parameters. Let's hit the sound volume. Sound volume pretty much controls the microphone and speaker volume on the access control phone. Various settings that you can select between the two. I would caution you in relation to not being too radical in regards to how you set this. For example, if we go and set the microphone as super sensitive and then we go and set the speaker volume on the access control phone super high, we are going to have all sorts of uh, distortion and speech problems. The environment that a access control phone and this is very important if it's a small enclosed area you wouldn't need that much volume and the microphone wouldn't have to be that sensitive and perhaps a more open environment uh, you would need um, a louder type speaker setting and a little bit more sensitive on the microphone my advice to you at this point in time would be simply to start off at the default settings and do a number of test calls to make sure that you have got the ideal scenario and situation and if you are going to be changing things don't go too radical just take take a, a step at a time to get the balance right next section is the NTP and time settings this is pretty self-explanatory if you have an NTP server 
you will recognize all this in relation to what time zones you're in, whether it's enabled, uh, daylight saving, etc, etc. You can have an automatic daylight saving or manual according to the dates that you've got down here. If you do not have an NTP server, you can set the time manually here onto the um, access control phone and just set, set date and it'll update the phone and the phone will look after its time itself, all by itself. We then go into video. The video settings, this is for the camera. You've uh, got brightness control on the camera if you're in a darker environment or a, um, a bright environment. You have a certain amount of adjustments you can uh, change the camera for. What resolution you want the camera to be um, displaying in. Uh, VGA is default. If you have it on high, that sets it up to 720. Power frequency, 50 or 60. Country dependent. The unit is Onviv compliant, or through, and that's probably, if, uh, for those who know what Onviv is, that is not the, the, the term to use. Uh, Onviv is more like an, a, an agreement of a specification and progress at the moment. Essentially, it's, a, it's an international agreement where that enables uh, manufacturers to um, have a, a set of specifications that they're compliant to, to enable connection with other Onviv compliant equipment e.g. it could be a um, network video recorder, other cameras, other, other security type, uh, type equipment. So the TransTel is on Viv um, compliant and by um, default is, um, is enabled. This is under the all under the video streaming so then we're going to decide what streaming mode we're going to be using. Whether we're going to be streaming RTSP or HTTP. We've got the codec that we're going to be using, options. This is the login to the camera device and the password, so that uh, where this is all heading, we, this is where we would use it for, a, um, for example, a network video recorder, an NVR. So the NVR is going to log in to the camera and actually use the, um, the camera itself to stream live video from whatever the camera is looking at. So you can actually enable your um, TransTel access control phone to be part of the security system as well and actually monitor a section. For example, if somebody comes up to the door and starts trying to tamper with the door, you'll actually have a bird's eye view of the person walking walking up there and having a, having a go. So it's quite a handy little feature to have. These allowed IP addresses are simply telling you what well, allows up to four um, four IPs or four devices to connect to the phone. Um, for example, this could be an NVR um, network video recorder here and this could be a another another device of some description, just um, another NVR if you want off-site um, recording it as well. Then we have got the um, LCD. This is the dis LCD on the actual display of the access control phones. Show the messages enabled or disabled. You can scroll it in X amount of seconds. Uh, night message equals day message, yes, um, or you can have two separate messages. And essentially, in that small display, you can give instructions to people. At the moment, it says "Welcome to TransTel Control, Access Control. Press Bell button." Okay, but you could have a, a, a message up to eight lines, and it'll just slowly scroll through each of the lines and you can have one for day and one for night. And that covers off the system parameters. Okay, I've thrown this extra section in here just in case you need to do a software upgrade. Okay, so now we are going to upgrade one of the TransTel IP door phones. So we have got our IP address which is up the top here, so we've just to browse to it, we just point at it, so it's 10.18.150.53. Before I upgrade, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a, open up a command prompt session here, and just show you one little way, little trick that we do, is that if we set up a ping, so type in ping, space, the IP address of 10.18.150.53, space, dash, t, that means continuous pinging. 
So now if I go enter, what's going to happen is my laptop is now going to continuously ping the um, IP phone. This is just going to, as you'll see later, this will give you an indication of what's happening um, with the phone and what status the phone is actually in. So I'm just going to minimize that down. I'm now going to log into the phone, so it's admin, default password is 1234. I go send and the main menu pops up. Now this is an IP3941 PC, piezo and C for camera, and the, the one mean is just a single button uh, phone. Here is the software version. We have uh, E02ABW-03-09. Older version, so we want to upgrade this. And uh, as we can see, it's all registered online here. So I'm just going to go to admin. I'm going to go to update local. I then need to browse to the new file, uh, the new firmware files. So if I go browse, it'll immediately go to my desktop, which is set up by default on my PC. But now I'm going to scroll down until I find there it is, IP394X. That's the folder that I have the firmware in. And if I go under firmware, there is the two files. I've got the main um, uh, update file, and I've got the checksum file. So the first line that I need is the main file. So I'll go highlight that go open. It'll come up here and tell you that it is all loaded. Now I need the checksum, so I now go to the checksum, which is the dot sum. So go OK, that is done. So now I'm going to go apply now, and then it's going to tell me not to touch anything while I'm doing it. So I'm going to go OK, and now I'm going to open up this. Now this has been merrily pinging away across the network. So what's going to happen now is that the firmware is going to be loaded up from my PC up into the um, IP39 series and then once it's loaded up what you'll find is that the phone will restart. Now when it restarts the pinging should stop. Now you've just noticed there the actual pinging has stopped and it's timing out. So what's happening is the phone is now rebooting with the new firmware and reloading it all up. Now this can take a little time to get started back up again after you've done the upgrade because the whole, literally the whole operating system's got to um, reformat and reboot and away it goes. So now the phone's actually telling you that yes, the, um, the network connection's up and running, but the actual phone might not necessarily be running at this stage. So the point I'm trying to um, point out here is that be patient. It will come back up. So it's pinging away, telling us it's loaded. So if I now click home, it looks like the main page is up. Now, it will not let you in until it's actually 100% operational. So if I click on admin and my password, and then go send, you'll notice it's timed out. It doesn't want to talk to me. This is normal. Don't panic about it. It just means that the phone hasn't completely started up yet. Bang, up it comes. So all we're trying to point out here, it could take a little bit of time. But you'll also notice that it still hasn't loaded up the firmware properly, so I'm just going to hit refresh, type admin again, and there we go. It still hadn't quite given us the uh, right information. So out of this whole upgrade, it's very simple, quick and easy steps. So there's a couple of traps just to be aware of, that particularly, and it really the only one is that last part, where give it some time to start up, and if you, um, at the moment, because we were rushing through and I was recording it, you could see that it was a little bit sluggish to come up or it took time. So the, the key thing is just give it time to come up. Once you've got a successful upgrade, there is the new version there. I've now got, instead of 0309, I've got 0403. That is now a successful upgrade. Uh, everything's done. Okay, so thank you for your time. I really do appreciate it. I know this has been a little bit of a long session for you. But I'm hoping this has um, helped you um, with a, a, an overview of um, how the Transtel um, 3940 phones work. If you've got any queries, just give us a um, give us a call, contact us, and we'll walk walk through. Um, there's um, many more releases of products coming up with an enhancements, etc. And um, this is a great opportunity, I think, for everybody involved. So. Um, I look forward to meeting you all one day. Uh, hopefully uh, we'll get around to that. And apart from that, have a great day. And again, thank you for your time. I know it is valuable. Cheers.